that you're here to worship with us. If you're able, would you stand with us? We're going to worship the King. We're going to lift high His name, and we're going to fill this place with praise. Come on, church. going to stop singing and today we have a new song we want to teach you guys and in the book of Galatians Paul tells us that the price of our freedom was paid by Christ on that cross and because of that truth this is our declaration This 
Treasure for the trader. No ear had heard, no eye had seen the image of the Father until heaven came to live with me. A rescue like no other. You are.
Jesus. You alone are worthy. And you are also worthy, God. Lord, one day we will see you face to face. will stand in the presence of our Savior and we will see the scars in your hands and the scars in your feet. And we will recognize to the fullness the worth of our God and the worth of our Savior. Help us in this moment to just get a little bit more of that understanding. to be overwhelmed by the worth of our Savior. For you are not some separate deity out there, but you are the living God over all things who stepped into our brokenness, who took our punishment, our sin, and our shame, who set us free. You are worthy of all that we are, of all of our praise. So stir in our hearts, God, that we would surrender it all to you and that you would have your way in this place. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you so much more. We worship you. We give you thanks and praise. And it is in Jesus' name we pray all these things. And all God's people said, amen. You can have a seat. My name is Alex and welcome to Rock Point. While you're here with us today, we encourage you to take out your smartphone, go online, and type in rockpoint.io. Here you can follow along with the sermon, take notes, keep track of upcoming events, join a group, serving team, or sign up for Rock U. Whether you're new to Rock Point or have been coming here for years, Rock U is the best place to find out about who we are and how you can get plugged in. Visit rockpoint.io and click on the Rock U tab to learn more and get signed up. Life was never meant to be lived alone. Groups are an incredible way to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus and experience life-giving community with other people here at Rock Point. We have groups all over the East Valley and we would love for you to be a part of one. Groups are launching in just a couple weeks and there are a few ways to get signed up. As you came in, you were given a groups card. Fill that out and drop it in any of the offering boxes before you leave. You can also register online by visiting rockpoint.io and clicking on the community tab to learn more and to join a group. Every year, Rock Point Missions provides backpacks and school supplies to children in need. Everything we collect goes to support local schools, foster kids, and children around the world. If you'd like to help out, head over to rockpoint.io for more details and to access the supply list online. We will be collecting supplies between now and next weekend. Our mission here at Rock Point is to point people to Jesus by loving people like Jesus. Thank you for being a part of this by living intentionally and through the faithful giving of your tithes and offering. While we don't collect the offering in service, we do have boxes near all the exits both in the worship center and the lobby. You can also give online at rockpoint.io. Let us know if we can help you in any way while you're here with us and be sure to connect with us on rockpoint.io and on social media to stay up to date with everything happening here at Rock Point. Every time I was paranoid of that, now I get to the last service and I just spilt my coffee. Sorry, we are (laughs) clumsy. Man, that's why I don't bring coffee out here all the time. I do that. I'm terrible. But I'm Bill, and I'm excited to be here. As you can tell, I was so excited, I'm throwing coffee all over the place. And, and, and it's great, but it, it seems like I, I, I never really left. It seems like I just finished baptizing people, and now I'm back. I don't know if you heard last week, we ended up baptizing 85 people spontaneously. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it was, it was great. 
And that was especially crazy because we just had a scheduled baptism a couple weeks before and baptized like 100 people then. So I didn't know if anyone was going to do it. But it was the way we opened up the series, We Are Rock Point, where we're talking about just what does it mean to be a church? And, and in extension, when you say what does it mean to be a church, you realize we kind of separate. When you say what does it mean to be a church, you're really saying what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be the body of Christ? And, 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 and what does that look like? And, and, and last week we opened up with the beginning of it is the first thing it means is that God intended life to be about the journey, not the destination. And that journey is a journey of getting to know Jesus, getting to know our Lord, getting to know God in a, in a deep, abiding way in a relationship. And that was the first step. And that's why a lot of people got baptized. They put their faith in Jesus or chose to, hey, I'm going to declare this relationship of grace that God loves me in my life. But that's not where it stops. To continue on this journey, what I want to talk about today is this idea that we weren't meant to go on this journey alone. We weren't meant to, 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 you know, Christianity is, is a team sport kind of thing. We're meant to go on this journey through life in community. And I was really reminded of this when I was on my road trip, because one of the stops we had, I have a picture here, I stopped it, and there's a, that's a giant redwood tree, and that's over in Chandler somewhere, I think. Um, no. And, and you can see, I'm, I'm actually standing, these things are, that's just a common one. That wasn't even one of the bigger ones. We just pulled off the side of the road, and I jumped on that one to get a picture, and um, these are huge trees, and they've been around since, like, you know, those, that tree was probably there when George Washington was fighting the American Revolution. I mean, these things live a long time, and they're strong, they're huge, and you'd think, wow, to, to be that strong and that stable, they must just have the biggest, deepest roots ever. They do have big roots. I'm standing on root there. That's what I'm standing on, but they, they don't really go that deep. So, so you wonder, how do these giant redwoods make it through storms, the high winds and the, and, and the struggles. And the reality is, is how they do it is their roots don't go deep, but they travel out far and they intertwine with the, with the, the, the trees around them. And, and how they survive is as a community. They survive by intertwining and being interrelated and connected to one another. And that's how they make it. That's why you will rarely, if ever, drive out down where these trees are and go through an open meadow and go, hey, look at that giant, solitary redwood sitting out in the middle of that field. It doesn't happen. They survive by being linked together. And that's really what God intends for his church, for us. We are meant to be in community. As a matter of fact, the big idea I just want to unpackage for a few minutes is simply this. We are rock point when we grow in biblical community. In other words, we are not rock point when we just sit in rows. We are rock point when we sit in circles. We need to be in circles, not just rows. Now, don't get me wrong. This environment is important. This is a time where we worship together. We celebrate together. We get, we get taught the word of God by a highly engaging, charismatic, good-looking pastor. I mean, this is the time when we have a good... I'm, I'm joking, by the way. Um, but uh, this is this, this moment. This is an essential part of that journey. But this isn't it. And you're really not living out. You're not a part of a church. You're not being the body of Christ. You're not really living the life and going on the journey the way God intended if you don't have a circle of people that you are doing life with in what's called biblical community. And, 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 and we often think, well, I'll do that if I have time. We think of community as optional. Community is not optional. It is mission critical. And it's critical for us. Matter of fact, I want to uh, read a passage to you. Remind me not to put my Bible there. It'll smell of coffee. But in Philippians chapter 1, starting in uh, verse 27, it says this, Above all, it's Paul talking to this church in Philippi, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So live, as you go on this journey, live together, live out the faith. Because look what he says, it says, Then whether I see you again or only hear about you, I will know. So he says, if you're living out this mission, if you're living out and conducting ourselves the way God intended us to be, he goes, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose. You're interconnected. But then look what he says, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. So that, that's kind of a, it doesn't sound like an optional thing. He's saying, if you're going to live out this journey and be who I've called you to be, you're going to have to stand together. You're going to have to intertwine. You're going to have to have roots. You're going to have to be united in the mission and purpose, meaning a church, being a Christian, is not about finding a place where you can go on your own little spiritual journey and quest and have this, this spiritual moment and become a better person. That, you know, on the way, we can become better people. On the way, we have our personal quest. But that's not what it's about. It's not just about me. We are to be united because there is an enemy. 
that wants to destroy us. It's talking about a spiritual enemy. There, there is an enemy of God that just doesn't want us to go where God wants us to go. And matter of fact, he loves the idea of you coming to church and only sitting in a row. Because then you'll go on your own little private spiritual quest and never get where God wants to go because he says when we unite together and have real community, that destroys the enemy. He'd rather us stand alone because then we feel like we're being spiritual, but we're not really getting anywhere. And if you reverse engineer that comment, if us uniting in community destroys the enemy, what happens if we try to stand alone? We lose. We lose. Biblical community is not an optional thing that if my life gets less scheduled, less busy, I can do. It is a life and death critical matter. It really is. So, so if, if, if that's true, if I'm going to believe that, why do we struggle with it so much? Why does a church like Rock Point, which is actually considered one of the strongest in the country for doing this, has about 40% of our adult attendance in community. 40%. That's considered massively successful. The average church has 20%. 80% of the people just sit in a row. And that's it. They come to church. We are double the average. So we're, woo, we're great. But I don't know about you, but if you took a test and got 40%, last I checked, well, when I was school, that was an F. Who knows? Might be a B minus now. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but it used to be F. Could you imagine? It's like, and that's considered good. So if it really is critical, if it really is, we will be destroyed if we stand alone. If it really is, if we don't unite and have community and get intertwined, we can't really be the unstoppable force. We can't really go where God wants, both personally and corporately. We'll never get where we need to be. Why does six out of 10, even in this church, stay outside of it? It's interesting. I think I have a little bit of an answer because I struggle with the, 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 the same things. I think there's a reason why we struggle, why many of us just feel like, I don't need it, or I don't have the time, or I just can't seem to fit it. And a lot of reasons we don't fit it is because there's two things. I think it has to do with our communications and technologies and things that have changed in the last generation. It's, it's radically switched even the way we think about real community. We think, we think about friendships. And the truth is, we have what I call a lot of false community, but that false community still takes our physical, emotional energy. And so it feels like we have a lot of plate spinning. And a lot of us, the reason why we don't want to make the time to find real community is we feel like I need another friend, like I need a hammer up to the side of the head. And for some of us, feel like I think I want less people in my life because we have so many things. The problem is what we count as community is not the kind of community we need. And what I mean by there's two things. We have a struggle with images versus presences and, and individualism versus communal idea of how we communicate, how we operate, and it's changed so radically, it's changing the way our brains think about this. And then it's influencing the way we come to church and try to live out what God says, this is the journey. But we don't get it, because we, we've been fed and taught such a different way. What do I mean by that? Images versus presences. When I was a kid, this is one of those services, like I become the old guy. Back in my day, back in my day, Area codes meant something when you called somebody. Most of you, if you're younger, you're like, it's just an irritated three other numbers you got to punch in. But back in my day, if you, if you remember, if you called another area code, what did that do to your phone bill? It went up. And here's the thing. It wasn't like you had to call another country. The Phoenix area had multiple area codes. And, and so if a friend moved even just 20 minutes away, it got expensive to call them. When I was in high school, I was in a long distance relationship. I know that it bothered my dad because the phone bill was ridiculous. And that, that girlfriend I had lived all the way in Fountain Hills. We went to the same school, but it was 20 minutes away, different area code. So if I talked to her for an hour, that was like a $7 phone call back then. And, and, and so what, so if, if that's true, and the only thing he had is phone or a letter, what happened when a friend moved away, even just 20 minutes away? They faded. You might hook, you know, see them every now and again, hang out, but it just kind of drifted. And you ended up, you would say, now that's my best friend for life. But you got a new best friend, didn't you? But now it's changed. We can call anywhere. We have FaceTime. You can actually see the person. We have social media. We can stay really engaged with people that don't even live near us. And, and, but the only problem with that is 
we have the images and their words, but you know what you don't have? They're not fully physically present in your life. And as much as we want to think that that's the same, it's not. Because there comes a time when there's problems happening that you can't do anything about. You can't be there for each other unless you're physically present. And you know that because I've been reading all the blogs and all this stuff. People on, 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 the, on the Facebook and stuff are getting so mad. I, I read that with all the turmoil in the world that, that people are starting to reject and saying, hey, if I read one more thing about a problem going on and someone just does the sad face emoji or says I'm praying about it, I'm so done with you. Acting like if, you, if, that, if all you're going to do is say you're going to pray in sad face, emotions, I'm done with you. If you are far away from them and something happens, what else can you do? You need to be physically present for real community to happen. Matter of fact, Jesus proved this. When he wanted to help guide us in life, he didn't just send us the ultimate tweet. This is not his Facebook manifesto. This is not his version of that I'm fed up video while he's sitting in a car. This came after he did something else. What was that? Physically incarnated as God became a man and dwelt amongst us. So the problem is we have this pseudo community that really can't do what it needs to, but it takes our time, it takes our energy, it drains us emotionally, and we get into all of this stuff, and then we don't have anything left in the tank for what we really need. And it affects us. The second thing that affects us with that is not just the images for those presence, is the idea that we've become much more individualized, even in the way we communicate, even in the way we make choices, even the way we do stuff. I mean, we've always been America, you know, but the reality is this, we're more less communal than we ever were. We don't even understand this idea of a communal experience as much anymore. For, for, for example, back in my day, if you liked a song from a band, how did you get that song? You had to buy the whole album. And, and, and if you went to a concert, you sat through the whole thing and you heard the two songs you liked, but the reason you stayed is you got the t-shirt, you're with your friends, it's a community experience. People come and go and they don't care and, and, and now you can just buy every song you want, put together your ultimate song list. You don't have to deal with the other stuff. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to do anything with that. I'm telling you, you could do back in my day, you could make a mixtape. And if a guy, ladies, if a guy made you a mixtape, you knew he was desperately in love with you because it took him 1,200 hours to make that. But now it's like you can just grab this song and that song and you can do the same thing. You can do it all over the place. You can, you can um, on Google News, we've even learned that how we get news and how we find out what's going on in the world, they have these little snippets. So I could sit there in a matter of 30 seconds, oh, disaster happened, thousands dead. What's going on in sports? Who cares where LeBron James is going? You know, what's happening here? You know, what's going on over here? And, and you could pick and choose and get it really quick. We have lost the ability to have any sustained attention on anything. So we go to the next crisis, from one to the next, and we get all Facebook frenzied over it and act like we're all emotionally invested, but we're not physically present to do anything about it. But man, we're spent. We're spent because we're not really there. And we haven't learned how to do it. Matter of fact, they, they, they did a, when it comes to even the way we relate to people, they, 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 um, it's not so much with movie stars, we kind of know they're weird, but, but the idea of like a blogger that you really like, they connect to you. People are now, can't even differentiate between the friendship they feel like they have with them and the friendship with the person that's actually physically in their life. And they did a study, there was a recently New York Times just a study, there was a blogger that, that she was well known for being really like light positive things about parenting and marriage. And everyone loved her stuff. Mass fire, she had a big accident not too long ago. And within two weeks, her followers had sent over $100,000. So you're thinking, well, well that's, that's going against what you said. There's community happening, really? Because when they sent the New York Times went out and interviewed these people that sent money, they said, hey, can you explain to us what made you feel comfortable sending money to a person you don't really know? And the writer used this particular word for said, everyone responded the same way that they asked this question. It says they snorted. Now that's a weird word to use, snort. Have you ever seen someone snorting? <laughs> I mean, when do you ever snort? 
you're about to laugh or if you're aghast or you're vexed. He described them snorting because they acted really, again, they were, they were like, <laughs> like, like, how's that guy doing that? Is snot going down his throat? What's happening? <laughs> to snort means you were taken aback. Like, like they were actually offended by the question. Like, how dare you ask that? What do you mean? Every one of them said, she's my friend. Never met her. Then they interviewed her sister. And her sister said, you know, she has a decent marriage. Her kids are cool and all, but, but she purposely chose to say, there's enough negativity in the world. I'm only going to share the positive things about my life on this blog. Never shared one negative thing. I know all the problems. They had this problem. They had this. They went to counseling once. And they're talking about the issues they had. Who really knew her? That changes our brain chemistry. And then you get the idea that we can like, be, we, 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 we want to individualize anything like life is a cafeteria and then we take that into our friendships we pick and choose matter of fact you, you think you can just get any music now you want but they have noticed this classical musicians we're not talking rock stars we're not talking think classical musicians you know have you ever been to a classical music what was it on a concert I guess it's still the same word I don't know I'm not highfalutin <laughs> I'm, like, I'm gonna go to the whatever you know and I don't know how they talk but 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 they, they they come and they've noticed in the last few years they're complaining that they said you know when you went to that there was a cultural experience a community experience. you got there you waited you had it you went in when they told you to you stayed the whole time they are now noticing that even at these classical concerts people are there's usually the first piece the second piece the third piece and a lot of times they put their most popular thing in the middle and and what's happening is since we're so used to just getting only what we want and leaving the rest out people are coming to classical musical concerts skipping the first piece staying for the second and getting up and leaving during the third you know what there back in the day the only people that did that was dodger fans <laughs> you laugh because you've been to a dodger game I mean, it, it, it Dodger Stadium, if you're there the first three innings, you think, wow, the Dodgers don't have a fan base anymore. By the fourth inning, it's packed. By the eighth inning, they're cleared out because they want to beat the traffic. That used to be the only way you did it. Now, classical music concerts, people are like, I don't really want that part. I just want that. Now I'm done. Let's get out of here. It's affecting us. We have false community. And we have this really individualized idea of how, how life should be for me. And then we come to church. And we try to pick and choose. And then you wonder why you'd be sporadic in your attendance. You wonder why you keep coming. You go, it was fun, but it hasn't really helped me in my life too much. We need real community. So what does that look like? What does that look like? I want to go, if you go back a few pages from Philippians in the letter of Galatians, to this letter to this church in Galatia, I just want to read a couple verses. And in here, these, two, these couple verses I'm going to read and teach you, there are four elements here that describes community that I'm going to point out to you. And, and, and really, these are the four things that describe what biblical community is. It's not just getting some friends. It goes deeper than that. We need to have these four elements in our lives. We need them, and we need to be them. And, and what I'm going to challenge you to do, if you're already in community, don't just check out. I get the A. I'm done with the test. I can stop. I want you to take this as a litmus test and evaluate your current community especially if you're in one of our small groups. And what I'd love for you guys to do is this week, maybe reflect on this and talk to each other and say, how are we doing at these four? And it might open a conversation go, you know, we're really great at them or we're not, or this one we're not so good at. And then talk about why are we not so good at this? Maybe we should do something about that. So here we go. Let me read these verses. Galatians chapter six starts off with this. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the, onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. In those two sentences, there's four principles going on here. Four things that I think we need to have. And the first one can be seen when it says, if someone's overcome, you who are godly should gently and humbly help. That gently and humbly help the person. The first thing is, how can someone know you're caught and you're in a danger and you need help if they don't know you? See, see, you can't have somebody come to you and try to help you out of the trap you're in if they don't know you. And, and see, a lot of people come to church and we just sit in the row all the time, never get involved deeper, and then you're struggling and no one helps you, and you say, man, this church is terrible. I gotta go find a new row to sit in. And the problem is you're never gonna get help in a row. 
You gotta be in a circle. People gotta know you. So the first principle is I need to be known to really, really be on this journey, to make it, to survive the enemy, to be able to really experience life at the level God wants me to experience that. I have to be someone who's willing to be known. And, and what do I mean by that? It says here, real about myself and honest about where I am. But the struggle we have is the one place we act the fakest is the place we should be the realest. And that's church, because we come in and we're like, I'm embarrassed, I don't want people to know who I really am. We're afraid of being rejected. We, we have all these issues, so we put on our, our church game face. And we, we come in here and act a certain way, and that's why sometimes we avoid community, because I'm like, I don't want people to really know my struggles. I don't want them to know my problem. Because you're afraid they won't be gentle, they won't be humble. You think you're gonna be judged and pushed away and whatever reason, and, and sometimes we just, we don't want to realize we have a problem, so we hide, and we hide in plain sight. Let me help you understand this. Back when I was a youth pastor and just newly married, I, I took a couple high school students who were baseball players, and I just finished my baseball college career a couple years before. So, so we, we went to the batting cages, because that's what guys do to grow together. They do stuff. So we, we, we went, and I'm going to mentor these guys, you know. So we're in there, and I'm hitting. And while I'm hitting, I, I went in there, and I took my helmet off, because the helmet they gave me fit horribly, and it smelled like the last person who used it died while wearing it. And, and it smelled like a mix of kitty litter and wet dog. It was weird. It was two smells you don't want together. And, and so I wouldn't wear it. And all of a sudden, he walks, this little eight, nine-year-old boy starts watching us. He's looking at me, he starts getting closer and closer, and I automatically assumed he's impressed with my hitting skills. So I'm like, hey, how are you doing? What's up? As I stopped for a minute, he goes, hey, you're not wearing a helmet. I go, yeah, I, I know, I don't, I don't need one. Yeah, you do, no, I don't. Yeah, you do, he goes, and he points at the sign. He says, you can't be in the cage without a helmet. He goes, you're breaking the rule, which I was. I didn't want him to point out. Now, maybe he wasn't being very gentle. He might have been humble, but I still didn't like that he was pointing out that I was in the wrong. I was violent, so I did the typical thing. I didn't want to really be known. I didn't want to deal with the problem. I wanted to be left alone. So I said, no, I can do this. No, you can't. Yeah, I can. No, you can't. Now I'm arguing with an eight-year-old. And, and I said, you know what? I don't have to wear a helmet because they have an unwritten rule here that says if you've ever played in the major leagues, you don't have to wear a helmet, which I never played in the major leagues, by the way. And, and, and he goes, you? And I go, yeah. He goes, yeah, right. And he walks away. And now, now, in that moment, I, I wasn't known. I wasn't real. I wasn't honest. I didn't want to be helped with my issue. I didn't want to be made aware that I was doing something I shouldn't be doing. So I just, I just made something up and pushed him away. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. He walked away. I looked. The two high schoolers are laughing. And we had this moment. I felt a little bad, but it's, you know, it's just in jest. It's no big deal. Done with it. A few minutes later, I'm batting again. And all of a sudden, you see him start scooting back closer again. And this time, he looks like the look on his face was... Maybe he really is. And these two high schoolers who I'm there to mentor picked up on that. So as he got closer, they started playing into the game with me. And they started, I'd hit a ball well, and they go, man, that looks like that home run you hit against Detroit back in 1990. <laughs> and so this kid's like. And we're laughing, and I think it's funny, but I felt a little bad. I'm not really being honest. I'm not being real. I'm letting him believe something about me that's not true. I should probably say something. And I thought, maybe I should, but you know, it's kind of embarrassing. He'll, get, he'll feel dumb and I'll feel bad. Maybe I should. So when I finally turned, he was gone. So I'm like, okay, All right, that wasn't the greatest thing to do. I looked at these guys, guys, it was fun, but I'm, you know, this probably wasn't the best thing to do. I don't know, but we're done, right? So I thought I'm over. We start to walk out to leave. We're going out towards the parking lot and all of a sudden this car goes, pulls up. You see someone rustling around inside it. The door opens and out pops this kid with a piece of paper and a pen. And he's running up to me. Hey, mister, can I have your autograph? Now, right then I'm thinking, this is a good time to be real and honest. But now I've gone this far in and it's getting worse. It's getting, it's like I feel more ashamed. I go, how could I possibly tell him now? I, I, I really, but you know what? He's gonna be so disappointed, he's gonna be so lame. I, I should probably tell him and right, I go, okay, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And right as I was about to do it, this person walks up, it's his mom. She parked the car and walked up right as I was about to tell him. And she goes, you know what? Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. The other Major League Baseball player that gives lessons here, the guy who actually was a Major League Baseball player, he's mean. And you've talked to my son. So, so thank you that you're willing to talk to him. And then 
I was like, I should tell her, take the slap and be done with it. And right as I'm going, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be known. Right as I about said, she grabbed me and hugged me. And as she hugged me, she said, thank you for being a role model for my son. So she's showing me love and grace and acceptance. But do you think that helped me? It didn't do anything. It made me feel worse that she's hugging me and accepting me because I, for something I'm not really am, that didn't make me feel better. It made me feel worse because as I'm looking over her shoulder, I see the two high schoolers I'm supposed to be mentoring. They've let the guy who runs the batting cages in on it and they're standing over there laughing hysterical. One of them's on the ground. So I'm like, not only does this not make me feel good, I came here to mentor them. And all I've shown them is pretend like you're something you're not and fool everybody. And so I'm sitting there going, what am I going to do? And so she lets go. She goes, like, you're really young. You said you used to play. Don't you still play? And I go, no, I only played for a little while because I said, tell her, and I just couldn't do it. So I finally went all in. And I said, nope. And I pointed to my knee scars, and I said, I had knee surgery. It affected my career. And I, then I said, everything I said, I gave her all these stats for two years. And all they were, they were exactly accurate. That's why I could lie like there's no tomorrow, because I knew every one of them, because I gave her everything I did in college and I just made it major leagues. So then I'm still feeling bad as I'm doing it. I go, I can't believe I'm hiding. I can't believe I'm doing this. So her love and encouragement and support and all that is not helping me. It makes me feel worse. And I think maybe, maybe I should be real. Maybe I should be honest. Maybe I should let her be known. But now I'm so far in, this is gonna hurt so badly to say it that I can't help it. And then finally he's like, I gotta get out of this. I just gotta get out of this. Instead of just being real, she finally goes, hey, well, can you sign the autograph? She goes, what's your name? And I'm like, God darn, I, did they ask my name? And I didn't want to tell her my real name. So I said, Bill Josephs. That's my middle name. So I said, I'm Bill Josephs. What team? And I go, I signed it. I said, okay, here you go. And I, I finally said, forget it. And I signed Bill Josephs, number 17, my college number, 1990 and 91. And I go, what team would a kid in California never know about or care about? I wrote Minnesota Twins. And I handed it. And he looks and he goes, Mom. And she looks, her eyes like to go, that's his favorite team. <laughs> He's like, did you, did you know Kirby Puckett? <laughs> sure, I know Kirby Puckett. I mean, I'm just like totally out there and, and just all over the place telling him this, feeling horrible, going, this is no good. And he goes, thanks, man. Thank you, Bill Josephs. The mom gave me another hug and they ran off and they go, this is the best day of his life. And I'm like, this is terrible. This is going to turn into the worst counseling issue of his life. All I could picture was I was so happy now that there wasn't Google and smartphones, but, but he left and he's like, he probably, all I can imagine this kid is what happened? Was he at school getting beat up saying, no, I met Bill Joseph. He's real. Or, or is he in a straight jacket somewhere right now, leaning back and forth in the fetal position saying, Bill Joseph is real. Bill Joseph's is real. Did, did, did he meet Kirby Puckett someday and say, I met a guy that played with you, Bill Joseph. And Kirby Puckett say, who? <laughs> Or maybe he's even a pastor now. And he talks about this hurtful moment when he realized someone just completely lied to him when he was a kid. I don't know. All I know is it started with, I was challenged with something that was off and I didn't want to deal with it. So I hid in plain sight. And the further I got in, the more afraid I was to ever try to get out of it. And even though that's a ridiculous example, the principle is exactly what most of us struggle with and many of us are doing right now. You're afraid to really be known because you've built your Bill Joseph story. And you're afraid that if I was really known, I would be rejected. And that's why that says we need to have people that are humble and gentle because we not only need to be known, we need to be accepted. That's the second point. We need to be accepted. You need a place where you can tell the truth. You can just be honest about your struggles. You could be real about where you're at right now and people won't run from you like you're a dinosaur in Jurassic Park. They're just gonna say they're gonna engage with you. They will accept you where you're at. In other words, you, we need to receive the healing power of acceptance and show the humility to be able to offer it to others. We need that acceptance. 
But it needs to go further than being known and accepted. Could you imagine if our community was just about, all right, you shared your worst problem and I'm not gonna reject you. And that's as far as it went. I mean, if someone came to your group one night and said, I killed two people, they're in the trunk of my car, I don't know what to do. And you're like, that's okay, I love you. And you hug them and say, you wanna borrow my shovel. I mean, is that, is that, is that where it should stop? It needs to go beyond that. We need to be known, we need to be accepted. And then the third thing is, we need to be supported. And that's where it says in verse two, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. Obey the law of Christ is love. He's saying that the Bible says that the world will know we're Christians by our love. He's describing what that love looks like. It's real community. It's loving community. And one of those things is we need to share and, and, and support one another. And that means we need to be known and accepted at a deep enough level that we can truly be helped with our burdens, spiritual, physical, emotional. It doesn't mean that your immediate community has to solve all those issues. They might need to know how to direct you towards the support you need. But we need to have that support system to help us when we're struggling. And it needs to be a physically present support system. It does. But some of us struggle with looking for that support because it's, 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 it's not even as deep as I, I feel like I'll be rejected. Some of us struggle with this idea of everything I'm saying because you're like my youngest daughter. She has a shirt that says like it's too people-y in here. She, she's not a people person. So she doesn't feel the need for this. But she knows she needs it. She went to a pool party with a high school group a few weeks ago when she knew she would hate. Her friend right there dragged her to it. And, and, and she goes, I'm going because what she realizes I need to be with my friends. I came and picked her up. What do you think of it? I hated it. But I'm proud of her. She did it anyways. Because she knows if she just lives in her room all the time, that's not healthy. So she chooses to. And, and some of us, that's your problem with community has nothing to do with everything I just said. You're just, you just struggle with being a people person and you never feel the need to be around. As a matter of fact, they cause you anxiety. And sometimes you think, since I'm not a people person, I don't need them, but that's not true. I wanna show you a short testimony video from a couple that got into one of our groups. And, and in this story, the, 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 the wife is the one that doesn't wanna go. She calls herself a hermit. Matter of fact, she's wearing, what, look at what her shirt says that she's wearing in, in the interview. And, and, and she was, didn't wanna go and her husband, it started off bad. Her husband heard a message on being in community like this and she just signed them up and said, we're gonna go to this small group. And she's, <gasps> but it turned out okay. Watch their story. From day one, Rock Point was like home. As soon as I walked in, we were there for the uh, start of the spoiler alert series and uh, nobody else could have been in there. It was all for me. Like the light was in my face. Bill was talking directly at me. You I know, mean, at one point I looked over at her and my brother and sister-in-law and they're staring at me and I'm like, do you guys call ahead or you know what? Found out about the home groups from Bill, pushing it in service and uh, he's very adamant about getting out there in the community. You have to have other people. He just came home and was like, I signed this up for small groups. And I was like, you did what? What? <laughs> I am, a hermit, so I don't like to be around people in general. So just happening to be in someone's home that I didn't know and interact with people that I didn't know was really scary. Me, um, it was more getting comfortable with them in the group. It was, wasn't like we we're getting together in the group. It was, we we're gonna go meet the friends that were there. They were very welcoming. I felt very comfortable after meeting them the first time. I was like, okay, I got this. We can keep going back. Yeah, pretty much. We left there, she's like, we like them. I think I've just been able to allow myself to not be a hermit and being around people and like connecting with them. And I felt comfortable, like I said, I could come in my pajamas if I wanted to, you know? And it's almost like you've known each other for years, but you just met like a minute ago. And then you see them in church and like familiar face. It's like, hey, what's going on? Personally, I learned that it's not something that you can do by yourself you know, in that walk. You have to have that alone time, but uh, there's gotta be somebody there with you. Kind of cool, huh? You see what her shirt said? It's way too people-y outside. <laughs> but look, she didn't think she needed it, but by the end she goes, I feel like I could come in my pajamas. Someone that's intimidated being around people would not want to go somewhere in their pajamas. She learned she needed it whether she felt it or not. And then I love what Mike said as he learned in this process, he already loved the Lord, he'd come to church, but by being in community, he got further in his walk because he realized there's something critical we need in community, and that's the fourth thing, is we need to be developed. We need to be developed. 
See, a lot of times you come and you, you get to this point where you're listening in church and you're like, I don't feel like I'm being challenged or fed as much as I was anymore. Congratulations, you're supposed to get that point. And one of the places that you need to be really challenged in your faith is with each other. The pastor's job, read my job description in the scripture. It doesn't say to do the ministry. It says that a pastor's job is to equip the saints to do the ministry. Meaning I preach the word and teach and we need to gather in circles and encourage one another and grow. And one of the last things that we need to be developed, developed in what? In the mission God giveth. That's back to the Philippians passage I read in the beginning. Our mission is, is to point people to Jesus by loving like Jesus, because we know Jesus. And what we've been talking about in the series, that looks like this. We need to know, we need to grow, and we need to go. And that's what we need to be challenged for. And so a lot of times, even in church groups, we stop short of the development because we don't want to challenge each other, because we don't want to offend them, we don't want to have a problem, because we don't really be known. We just want to have some Bible study and have some fun and get some friends. But if you don't get to the point that you're looking at each other and say, hey, here's your issue. Let me help you back to the right path. Let's help each other. Let's be humble, let's be gentle, but let's be real. And let's become more like Jesus. And here's the thing that's funny is, and you still might resist it or feel like I don't need this, but there's also another side to this coin. Not only do we need to be known, accepted, supported, and developed, we also need to people that know, accept, support, and develop. Even if you don't feel like you need it, God wired us for each other. And so we need to be in people's lives. We need to be that for other people too. So there's sometimes you're in a group, you're like, yeah, I'm just not feeling it right now, I'm not. But you know what, you might be in that group, you might need to be there because you need to be that for somebody. And so sometimes when we think, well, I think community's optional because I don't really feel the need for it right now, someone's missing out because you're not engaging. Matter of fact, they had the same problem back here. Same problem, because look what Paul says to this church in, in verse three, and it is a colossal throat punch of all throat punches. He says, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Wow. We're not that important, but we are loved that much. What he's saying is, is, is if I think I can't do this, I know, and I don't think anyone in this church, I, I really don't believe someone would come in and say, <laughs> My life is so important, I don't have time for the riffraff. I don't think you're gonna say that. But you know what we say? We say, my work schedule's too weird. I don't have time. My family is too weirded out. I, don't, I can't do this. My, my, have you met my kids? You know, stuff like that. We say these things that say, I, I can't do it. And, and we actually feel sorry for ourselves. We act like I'm a victim that I can't be in community. When the reality is, when we make those choices, what you're saying is it's impossible. Something God says is a must. It's mission critical. You can't survive without it. And we say, I can't do it. The reality is you are inadvertently saying, my schedule is more important. My time is more important. What I wanna do is more important than doing what God says you desperately, desperately need and other people desperately, desperately need it from you. That's what he's saying. That's why I say we are rock point when we grow in biblical community. You are not really a part of a church until you get in a circle. You just attend a worship service if all you do is sit in a row. And you are left out in the open, exposed to the attacks of the enemy and we need one another. And the bottom line is, we need the entire thing. You need all four of those. You can't just pick and choose, we need them all. Matter of fact, I, my favorite illustration for this is an Oreo cookie. Mmm, Oreo cookie, delicious. Maybe you are like a kid or you have kids. How do kids tend to eat Oreo cookies? My kids, I don't know about your kids, they would lick that and then not touch the cookie part. I'd walk into the kitchen, look like Oreos had a battle. They got their guts thrown. One of them sitting there going, tell my wife I love her. You know, it's like, it's awful. It's a carnage. And, 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 and they only want the middle part. They just want the sugar, the feel good, the yummy taste part. They don't want the crunchy exterior. They don't. And that's how they eat it. But you know what? It's not just kids. Pastor Mark, Mark Collins, he was out at the World Wildlife Zoo a while back and he went to the monkey exhibit and they were doing the, this thing where the trainer was talking about the monkeys and what they do to get the monkeys to be a little bit more active so people can see why he's talking, they give them Oreos. And, and the, you know what the monkeys do? And then drop the, the, the cookie part. But there was even one monkey that not only didn't want the cookie part, he seemed to be offended and angry that he was even given the cookie part. So they said he would grab it, lick it really fast and then get mad and throw the cookie at the trainer. 
And apparently the trainer was used to it, Mark said, because he would sit there and as he's talking, he'd be like, <laughs> and just dodge it like this, this monkey. He's like, not only do I only want the middle, I'm mad that you're trying to give me the other two pieces. Can I, here comes my throat punch of the day. Many of you, that's how you act when it comes to us trying to get you into community. You act like a monkey. You want the creamy middle and then you're actually mad that we try to give you the S and you throw it back at us. How dare you? And what do I mean by that? The middle is the middle of these four things. Acceptance and support. Everybody wants that. But we wanna be accepted without really being known. And we wanna be supported without being developed. In other words, what we're drawn to, and sometimes groups just become this, and no one's trying to really be in community. And that's why you might have had a disaster experience in the last community you tried. It might have been a whole bunch of monkeys that just wanted acceptance and support. Meaning we wanna come here and we want you to accept what I tell you about myself without getting to know me and give me what I think I want. Just give me what I tell you I want. Give me that. I want this and this and this, but I don't want to be developed. Don't challenge me. Just give me what I ask for and accept what I tell you. Don't know me. Don't tell me what to do, basically. Don't try to develop me. We just want the creamy inside. It doesn't work that way. The whole cookie is what's the best. We need the whole cookie of community with a nice glass of Holy Spirit coffee or milk, same thing. Mm. Oh, that's the stuff. That's the stuff. And you know why we need the whole cookie? We need the whole cookie because of this. When I allow myself to be truly known and to know and truly be accepted and to accept, that makes us vulnerable open to what God wants to do. And when I become vulnerable, I then allow myself to be supported and developed. That makes us unstoppable. That's what Paul was saying in Philippians. When we get the whole cookie, we become vulnerable, which allows us to become unstoppable. And that's why the enemy doesn't want you to have the whole cookie. So I'm gonna challenge you when you leave. I'm going to challenge you, if you're not in community, to fill out a co co one of these, preferably not coffee stain like mine. Find community. Get into community. We need the whole cookie. We desperately need the whole cookie. And a matter of fact, we're going to hand you Oreos when you leave. So yummy, you get to eat an Oreo. But I'm going to challenge you, if you're going to fight me on this, if you're going to fight the Lord on this, I hope I've ruined your ability to ever eat an Oreo cookie again. Because <laughs> every time you see an Oreo package, an Oreo cookie, a commercial, it's going to be a personal little delicious throat punch to remind you that you need to be known, accepted, supported, developed, and you need to know, accept, support, and develop. Because when we do that, that's when we are rock point. Father God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you love us so much. And I thank you that you've invited us on this journey that we're not supposed to go alone. So Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would know you but they would choose to pursue growing in community with others. That Lord, that we would get our roots intertwined in ways that when those storms of life, when those winds howl and those, the, the lightning blast, that, that we will withstand those attacks. We will withstand those storms because we're better together. So Lord, give us the courage to, to find that community and to be that community. I pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.